Today, my wife and I are visiting Colonial Williamsburg, an amazing living history museum in Virginia that tells the early part of America's enduring story. Come along with me and my wife as we explore a history buff's paradise. That's coming up next. Yeah, I bear, I bear attack it, and then you're you're done with it. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we get some more of that? Maybe she she, 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 she does yes some more. Yeah, folks, feel uh, feel free and uh, if you have any questions, ask away. Um, you've walked in the fountain. There's one thing. There's there's no no touching on the um, in the shop in here yet. But you've walked in the foundry where we end up pouring metal here. If you uh, hammer metal, you tend to be a smith. Some shapes easier just to pour into a mold, so we're, we're doing that here in the foundry. And uh, we're pouring uh, you know, quite a few different alloys or metals, you know, uh, brass and bronze here, silver, if need to, gold, um, iron, uh, pewter, lead, all of the above, really. And we're pouring uh, most of it over 2,000 degrees, You're able to achieve that with the forge here. We'll burn charcoal or coal, and then the air is forced in the bellows. The more you pump, uh, the hotter it gets. And we pour directly in molds made from sand. You need something that can take the heat and not burn up. I've got two halves of a sand mold there on the counter. It's a sand that we get from England, and it has a little bit of clay already in its own binder. And we add some water, and we're able to pack the sand pretty firm around the model. And doing that will uh, leave an impression in the sand. We sort of pull the wood model out of the sand when you do, it'll leave an impression then for us to pour into. And then what we're doing behind me here, the finishing work, is where we spend uh, the bulk of our time in here, probably you know, 90% is, is the finishing work. So what right now we're working on some pewter plates, it looks like just plates. So would an engraver this time period do like a lot of the candlesticks and plates or what were some of the... Well, we have our own engravers behind us on the property here in front do the engraving. It's a new shop that's come in town here this summer. So we're getting these plates cleaned up for the engravers to do what they want, what people want done on, on the plate. Right, right. But again, feel free to look around. If any questions, ask away. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, take a look around and ask any questions if you have any. 
Um, we were just kind of, as you're we talking, as you're we coming in there, we were just talking about these um, copper plates that you see on a lot of the shelves here. Uh, they're copper printing plates, right? Uh, an artist would contract an engraver, we would cut this plate, and then the artist could take the plate to a printing house and get as many copies as they needed. Right? Usually a couple hundred. This is how you're mass producing that artwork. Um, we do a lot of that kind of today. Uh, you wouldn't have seen too much of this kind of work in Williamsburg at the time. Uh, we only know of one plate that was cut here, and that was specifically for printing paper money in the 1770s. Um, this is something you're going to see in larger cities, predominantly. Boston, New York, Philadelphia, places like that. Uh, what we get into the most is uh, what my colleague's working on today, actually, is um, any kind of what we consider object-based engraving. So customers would bring us in um, any kind of metal wares that aren't steel, and we're typically engraving things like names or initials or family crests on there. Right? Uh, something that is uh, going to make it look a little bit nicer, for sure, but it's definitely, uh, more importantly, adding identifying information, right? Uh, it's a lot harder for somebody to just steal your money if you got your name card into it, basically. Now, how long would that take? Something like an initial, <clears throat> I mean, it's, I'm trying to remember how many pieces we've got here, 15 or so, uh, but each one is going to take 10 to 20 minutes. So it's okay. something that simple is pretty quick. Okay. And that's, again, kind of the bulk of what we're doing, right? Um, more people can afford smaller items like silverware compared to you know large teapots or large right. bowls, and uh, more people can afford smaller engravings. Right? Uh, unfortunately, we don't see too many examples of direct prices <clears throat> for engraving from the 18th century. We kind of figure the rule of thumb is if you can afford the item, you can afford some sort of engraving on it. Right? Just like today, if you come in, we can give you a $10 engraving or can give you a $200. Same piece, just kind of depends on you know what you want it to look like and how much you're willing to spend on it. You know, what about the family? You were talking about the family crest, yeah. Um, well, that, that's definitely more complex. How long would the timber with that take? Uh, I mean, it depends on again how complex exactly it is. You can figure um, some of the more basic ones you're looking at, uh, at probably an hour, uh, oh, wow. including drawing it out and laying it out. Okay. Um, uh, the nice thing is, we don't we're not doing the design work, we've just got to fit it to whatever piece it's going on. Right. Uh, but then you figure um, you know, an hour to draw it and cut it. And then you get into really elaborate crests, um, and especially coats of arms where you've got so many different elements. Right. Um, you know, you're looking probably a day or two uh, for some of the higher end ones. Um, but again, the people that, are, that have those crests and have those coats of arms, they can afford that. Um, and, it, and they're not in a hurry to get it. You know, we're not going to make any money if we take too long engraving it, but we don't get paid by the hour in the 18th century. Uh, if you're an apprentice, you don't get paid at all, right? But if you're a journeyman, you're getting paid by the day, okay. um, or by the piece that you work on, just depending on where you are. And journeyman is a step up from an apprentice, right? Yeah, yeah so your apprenticeship in the 18th century, um, usually it's about seven years, and just it can vary a little from trade to trade. Uh, we see engravers, in particular, looking for apprentices to start anywhere between the ages of 12 and 14. And when you get into an apprenticeship, it's it's a legally binding contract. Right? Right. It's a form of indenture, and that contract will specify whether the pe time period is you know a set number of years or whether it'll uh, just have an end date on it. Right. Uh, okay. So most commonly, we see for a period of seven years, or we see uh, until they reach the age of majority, which is the twenty-first birthday. Right. Uh, you're considered an infant in the eyes of the law, uh, English law until you hit 21, so somebody's got to le be legally responsible for you. Uh, and so that's why you're kind of locked into that indenture for that time frame. Unlike mm -hmm. today, where it's 18. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there is some argument that um, the apprenticeships for women would end at 18 in the 18th century. It would just kind of depend on circumstances, where you are, what, you, what the time period is, right? Uh, and the guys in the courthouse can get into those kind of intricacies. So, do you know what sort of apprenticeships were available for women? Any of them. There's no restriction in the 18th century, right? Um, there are certainly male-dominated trades, which are going to be the majority of them, but women-dominated trades are things like um, spinning and dyeing, and uh, uh, not so much dyeing, spinning, um, millinery work, uh, things like that, but there, there is no restriction on women in, in the trades in the 18th century. Uh, the only one that's a little questionable is something like uh, apothecary work. And it's not because of the trade itself, it's because that women, uh, whoever's working on apothecary has to know a lot of Latin, right? And it's difficult to find a tutor willing to teach a woman Latin in the 18th century. 
that's the key. And what, 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 what trade is that again? Which, uh, apothecary. What, what is that? Um, they're kind of your, they're doing all sorts of things, but it's, you know, pharma, pharmacy, surgery, oh, okay. dental work, okay. Um, okay. your early medical field. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Something like this, mm -hmm. how long does that take you guys? About 40 hours, 35 to 40 hours. Oh, okay. So about a full week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you know, this is the type of thing, so this is kind of a whole separate side of engraving. Again, that's more common, that's where we're getting a lot more of, um, you can think of it kind of like your bread and butter as an engraver, right? That's your day-to-day -day work. <clears throat> this stuff comes in a little less frequently, and again, hardly at all here in Williamsburg. Um, and it's very expensive up front, right? So whoever's commissioning something like this has to have a lot of money to pay me to cut the copper um, and pay for the copper itself. But the idea is they're going to get a couple hundred prints off of that plate, and then they're going to be able to recoup all those costs and then some, right? Um, we do see pricing for that a little bit more often. Um, I know Paul Revere uh, up in Boston, he's cutting uh, a lot of copper plates, um, and he charges uh, about three pounds sterling for a six by four inch copper plate with a good amount of engraving on it for printing. Um, you figure the average tradesman at the time is earning about 30 pounds a year. So a tenth of a year's salary just into that one piece. Uh, but again, he prints four, three or four hundred copies off of every one of those. So what's the difference between uh, an engraver and a silversmith? It's, Revere was a silversmith? Revere was a lot of things. Okay. Yeah. Um, he serves an apprenticeship as a silversmith. Um, his father that owns the shop, right? and he passes away. Um, at that point, everything gets a little kind of hazy, because uh, Revere's not 21 at that so he can't inherit the business. And there is some argument that he never actually finishes his apprenticeship in the shop. Um, but he, he's still a fairly accomplished silversmith. He gets into engraving, he gets into bell founding, he gets into copper foundry work, he gets into copper plate production. He owns a hardware store at one point, right? He's all over the place. Um, and he's, he's kind of the exception rather than the rule. Um, there are plenty of uh, tradesmen in the colonies at the time who are crossing those boundaries a little bit. Right? You'll have a lot of silversmiths who will learn the basics of engraving enough that they don't have to send their work out to somebody else if it's something small like a piece of jewelry. Um, and it's just ornamental work, right? Once you start getting into any kind of lettering or script work, that's where you want a more practiced hand. Uh, because, you know, if I make a mistake in the middle of that picture, you're not going to know, right? The artist might know, uh, but whoever's looking at it, it's, it's all the same. But everybody knows what letters are supposed to look like, right? And how they're spaced and slanted. Um, so you need somebody who's really practiced and really skilled to be able to do that, that kind of work. Uh, so we know a um, gentleman who ran this shop at the time, again, he's mostly advertising himself as an engraver, but he is advertising as well as a goldsmith. And he's pretty, we know he's producing things like rings, right? anything that's small and it, the basics are easy to learn. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a wrap for this Colonial Williamsburg video. I hope you really enjoyed it, getting to see another part of this amazing Living History Museum. If you like this sort of stuff, check out my other videos. Check out colonialwilliamsburg.org to plan your own visit here because it's so much co cooler in real life than it is on film. Till next time, this is History Buff, TN Photobug signing out, and I'm having a blast with the past.